for a few moments, just about a half hour or thereabouts, and we'll be back. Thank you. I'd like to call the public session of the meeting back to order. Uh, at this point in time, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hicks for the superintendent's report. Okay, this one on, Chuck? All right. Uh, thanks. We're going to provide an update on the reopening plan to the Board of Education. We are also providing an update to. Is this one? Okay, there you go. Thanks, Tim. Okay. So, uh, first thing these are the feedback groups that we've gone to over the last couple of months to get feedback on the plan as we've written it. Uh, on July 14th, we had a group of teachers that came in. We presented the plan as it existed at that point. There were some good ideas that the teachers had when we reviewed it. We built those into the plan. On July 16th, we had a Google Meet with parents. We had 250 parents participate. They had many questions. We gathered their questions together. We took their feedback. We made a couple of changes to the plan. On the 16th, we also met with the support staff, got their input. Uh, we also made some adjustments based on that. Today, we met with the elementary uh, faculty and staff, presented everything that we're going to do with the Board of Education tonight. We're in the midst of getting more feedback. Uh, tomorrow, we meet with the middle school faculty and staff, Wednesday with the high school faculty and staff, and then Thursday, the day before the plan is due, we meet with as many parents as want to log on to our live stream YouTube uh, parent question and answer session. So Google Meet, when we use that particular platform, it has a limit. The YouTube live stream, you could have thousands of people log in. We're taking questions in advance. The email is questions at clarenceschools.org. Rob is going to uh, categorize those questions. We're gonna answer everything that the parents have, and then if there's enough time left, we will take some questions from the live stream. Okay. Um, should we ask questions as you move along? Yeah, you, sh you guys should ask questions as we go. Please, just, board Just members. for clarity on your, your last comment on re with regards to questions, taking them in advance. So just to be clear, during the meeting, will we be accepting questions or not? During this live stream, Correct. Mike? Um, we're not going to accept questions during the live stream. We're going to do a small presentation like we're doing here with the board, and in that presentation is going to have all the questions. We're up to about 85 questions right now from uh, parents. Okay. So it, is, the, is there a fair deadline um, where you're not going to be able to accept additional questions after? Probably like 3 o'clock on Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, if we finish early, we're thinking about 90 minutes as kind of the hard cut point. Uh, we'll take questions right from, we'll have Rob and Kristen take questions right from the thing and we'll answer them in real time. Okay. Okay. So the governor came up with these metrics after the last time we spoke with the board. 5% or lower daily infection rate on a 14 day mo moving average. If your region is in phase four, that's the criteria for opening schools. Next week, the governor makes his announcement. We really can't make our decision until the governor makes his, but we have a place that we're leaning right now that we're talking about the faculty, to the faculty and the community with. If the infection rate gets 9% or higher, he will close all schools again. Now, it is possible that the governor will not open schools next week. It's possible even with these metrics, which he has not referenced in the past week, by the way. It's possible that even with these metrics, he will say 100% remote, okay? It's unlikely he would say 100% in person or hybrid. He would probably make individual school districts make that decision. We don't know, though. He could. Um, we have worked with 
many other state plans. We've worked with other colleagues across the region, and this is the official guidance that we've received. So most of this has come in since the last time we spoke to the Board of Ed. On July 13th, we got the Department of Health official guidance for reopening schools, New York State Department of Health. It's 23 pages long. It deals exclusively with health and safety operational issues. We have everything that is necessary and mandatory in our plan from that particular guidance. Uh, the next day, the Department of Health released checklists. The checklists had mandatory items and consideration items. All of the mandatory items are built in to the plan. There are some consideration items that are built in, and there are some that we can't do. On July 16th, late, the State Education Department released their guidance. It was 144 pages long. It repeated much of what was in the DOH guidance. It also puts forward mandatory and consideration. We have all the mandatory items in our plan from the State Ed Department, and we have many of the consideration items. On the 17th, there was clarification to that SED memo that was created and made. It was one interpretation of social distance and masks along with a couple of other things. Then, less than a week later, they sent out another clarification. They have not yet sent other clarifications this week. They really would have to have it out by tomorrow in order for us to consider it to put it in the plan. On Friday of last week, the CDC came out with new guidance on reopening schools. Everything that was in the CDC guidance was already in the SED or DOH guidance. It's all, everything that was there is being done by the school district. So, um, we gave you the eight categories of the plan the last time we met. If you go to our website, and it's been posted up there for a week, the community can go grab the new plan there are highlights in red are things that we added from the last iteration of the plan. Could you just comment with all the different guidance we've gotten? Um, you talked about the role the governor plays. He's going to either open or not. And then we probably have some um, decisions to make relative to the approach we open under um, if he allows that. But relative to people are reading or seeing um, uh, news publications and so forth, State Education Department, New York State Department of Health, Erie County, who's the governing body as far as some of this guidance goes? Well, if there wasn't a pandemic going on, it would be the State Education Department. But since the pandemic has started, the governor has been calling all the shots. The New York State Department of Health really is the governor. It's the state government, and it's just an agency in the state government. So right now, the guidance that we've received, anything that's health, safety, or operational is governed by the New York State Department of Health. Anything that is academically related is governed by the SED. Okay? That's where we're at. These were some of the changes that we made to the operational portion of the plan. The operational portion of the plan has many procedures and protocols in it. Uh, we designated Rob as the COVID-19 safety coordinator. It needs to be an administrator. It's him. We also put a protocol in for cleaning the school health office. There's some different things that we need to do when we clean the school health office than we do in a regular classroom. We also put some additional information on ventilation across the school district, and we put a bunch of new information on routing, busing, disembarking from transportation, and the transportation staff themselves. Most of this was mandatory stuff that was in the guidance. We plopped it in there. So it's all there in red for the community to see. Um, we will have meals consumed on site, if we go to a hybrid model or an all remote model, we will still have to serve meals to those people who are not in school. So if you're in school, we can serve you the meal. If you're out of school that particular day, we're going to need to set something up like we had the last three months of last year with Sodexo. We still haven't determined the central point, but it really makes sense that the high school would be the central point because that's where we do the cooking of the meals. We're thinking brown bag, one hot choice, one cold choice. Tricia? Are all the meals still free? That's the part that hasn't been determined yet, that if we have to serve for a hybrid or for remote, if it's going to be like it was before and we get reimbursed for all the meals as if they were free, or if we do have to charge people on their accounts unless you were free and reduced. So we're hoping it's free because that's easier and more beneficial to parents. 
Um, there's substitute teacher information that was brand new in this particular iteration, and we clarified information about safety drills. So we do have to conduct four lockdown and 12 fire drills over the course of the year. We need to maintain social distancing when we're doing the fire drills. We need to maintain them when we're doing the lockdown drills. We're going to cover the windows on the classroom, something that we haven't done before. There's a couple of other procedures in there as well. With regards to transportation, um, just two questions. Uh, one, clarity relative to uh, the guidelines on the distance and the masks. Um, I know there's some language relative to um, if, if a student is, is unable to wear a mask, they right. don't have to, but is that something that needs advanced approval and would that uh, election or, or, or application, if you will, carry through the school day or is the bus in the building looked at differently? So those are good questions. Let me take a shot and then let Rick take a shot. Um, as far as the bus is concerned, we believe the back seats of the bus are barriers and they can serve in the total number of kids that we can have on a bus. We, uh, we also canvassed parents. So we did, a, we did a canvassing. We asked parents to go online and answer four questions about busing. And Rick, why don't you go through the results? Sure. What ended up happening is so many people want to take their child to school that in the morning, if we had full participation, all students at school, we can get the bus down to about 35% of capacity. In the afternoon, it goes up to about 44%. If we end up doing a hybrid plan, which is half, then those numbers get cut in half. Um, that would be one per seat, at least. And as Dr. Hicks mentioned, those seats are meant to, in essence, be airbags, so they are full coverage in front of you. So one thing that we will do is sit siblings together on the bus, mm -hmm. okay? So if they're in that same particular bus run, siblings will sit together. Otherwise, it's usually one kid per seat on the bus, and we think we're within those distancing rules. I guess the other question, um, obviously we're primarily focused on the students coming to our buildings, but we transport students that are going to a lot of other placements and to private and parochial schools. Um, they too are making their own elections relative, or they would be opening what the guidance they're gonna operate their facilities under, timing, et cetera. Does our busing need to adapt to the multitudes of those options, or does our election kind of govern? That's a good question. Um, one of the things that we're finding out, because we've been in contact with all of the non-public, many of the non-public schools, is that they're changing a lot of their timing and their time frames of opening, and we'll adapt as best we can um, the students on that bus, um, if, if they have many more than we did, Mark, our first thought is that we would adapt to them. We will be disinfecting with the actual disinfectant, not just cleaning the buses in between every single run. It's not going to be perfect, though. There will be kids that are late for their private school runs because of the availability of the busing and what we have to do with the kids who are in Clarence schools. But it will be close, and we work with the principals of those privates to make sure we can adequately transport the kids. The same rules hold true, though. They're going to have to, when kids disembark, they're going to have to be six feet apart. They're going to have to have a protocol for that. Um, if the student does not have a mask on the bus, we will have masks to give the student. If the student refuses to wear a mask on the bus, you have to transport them that day, but then they would go through the process of vetting. So there's a process for us to vet uh, medically vulnerable kids who, for some reason or another, maybe breathing problems, cannot wear a mask. We would give them face shields instead as an alternate form of PPE. If we couldn't do any alternate form of PPE, we'd have to have a conversation about either fully remote instruction for that, that student or something that we would have to go pick the kid up with a singular bus because we can't have the student without a face mask with other students in there uh, because it puts everyone at risk. Thank so, you. you know, those are to be determined, but we have a protocol for making the decisions. And again, there's a bunch of new information on masks in the, the new iteration of the plan. 
and new employee health screening procedures as well. So really with parents and employees, we're sending a text message on a daily basis. Parents would receive the text, text message, they would click on the um, link, the link would take them to a web page where they would answer four questions. Is it four or five questions, Rick? They'd answer the four questions. If any of the answers are yes, they have to keep their child home. If all the answers are no, they can put their child on the bus or bring their child to school. Same thing for staff, same thing for parents, daily basis. Uh, cleaning, infecting, yep. uh, cl cleaning, sorry James, go ahead. Is each link, when they click the link, is that linked to that kid? So we, we track, so if, when, when we get a text and we click the link and then I answer yes for my daughter, that's linked to her, right? Yes, and that's how we'll be able to have the attendance clerks every day know which families didn't respond. So there may be a point where you have to put the kid's name in. Do we have to do that? I can't remember. Uh, we're still working on that. All right. We're trying to get it so that all the parent needs to do is click, and it automatically populates the student name. Yeah. I don't know if we can get that done. We might, the parent may have to put the student name in. Okay? With, with regards to the screening, and this just a minor, I, I, just to point out, within our plan, there's conflicting information. Do we have clarity on what the temperature is? 100.4, and we, we saw that that was wrong, and we made that switch, so. Because the, the New York State guidance document has 100 listed, so to your prior Is it? Comment. I thought it was 100.4. Yeah, so it was 100.4, and then a couple of things that the CDC had came out at 100 even. So okay. right now, unless something changes, I think we need to go with 100. All right, so we'll so make we that change. we just need to clean that up before we submit. We, we cleaned it up to 100.4, but I think we need to make it 100. Yeah. So we will do that. Um, there's cleaning and disinfecting following a suspected or confirmed COVID case. And again, if we have a suspicion of a COVID case, the student is taken to the nurse, they're isolated, their parents are contacted, they're uh, encouraged or mandated to go get a test for that particular child. We notify the Department of Health. The Department of Health gives us a contact tracer if the student is positive, the contact tracer helps us make decisions about uh, which portions of the building need to be deep cleaned, things like that, whether or not something has to be closed off like a hallway. Anything else on that, Rick? Okay. Uh, plan for returning to school after exhibiting symptoms. This has changed multiple times, and whatever the newest CDC guideline is, we put it in there. It's usually 10 days, the last three days of which must be fever-free without fever medicine. And if that, if that doesn't kick, if, you're, if, it, if you have a fever that day, the whole 10-day cycle starts over again. Hannah Muller is our district COVID-19 coordinator. So um, Rob is the district administrator in charge of the safety. Hannah is the nurse in charge of the coordination of all the medical stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll have a protocol written by Hanna and our school medical director, Dr. Fransimone, about what teachers should observe in classrooms as signs of illness. Okay, that's in the process of being developed. That was additional to the plan. Yes, uh, they talked about in the state plan and our plan about really almost like two different health offices of students are sick. So do you have that? We need them, yeah. We need two spots, Dennis. One that can be an isolation area, one that's general health office. Some of them have it right next to each other, like the high school. Others we have to devise, okay? We need an isolation room, though. That's absolutely necessary. Um, we also put in medically vulnerable high-risk group kids. So again, if there's a reason why a student can't wear a mask, they need to be vetted properly through the procedures that we have written down from the ADA, from the Americans with Disability Act. Then we'll make a decision on what reasonable accommodations the kids need to have. And if the reasonable accommodation is the kid does not wear a mask at all, then we have to have special circumstances for that particular child, okay? Could you just, and I know it's, it's spelled out, but I know there's been some confusion around the mask or barrier, mask and, the distancing. Right, right now the way that it reads is six feet or a mask, six feet slash barrier or a mask. That's the most current iteration. People think the slash means or, but we're trying to get guidance from SED and the Department of Health. Does the slash mean and? Because okay. I know there was a 
article in the Buffalo News today that, yes. that touched on that, so it's going to bound to raise questions. Look, when we're trying to figure out what a slash means, you know, that we're into the nitty gritty and we can't get any information from the Department of Health. They are not responsive. So we're going we're gonna to err on the side of caution and say, <clears throat> and. Okay, real quickly, uh, there were, there, in each, in the plan, there are elementary building procedures, middle school and high school procedures. These are things like hall traffic, changing times, entering and exiting the building, uh, use of bathrooms, use of the uh, water fountains, things like that. So we added some additional traffic pattern stuff, taking attendance protocols, protocol for after school care, the YMCA program that exists, which still will continue to exist. They'll have to have the six feet guidance and other protocols in place. And we put in a couple of new elements for those school buildings. So that's all in the most recent iteration of the plan. This is a photograph of what the polycarbonate divider looks like. So um, you can imagine the desks are in rows and columns, the dividers are in the front and on what would be the left side, and then the other divider for the other kids serves as another, di as another divider. And again, we're going to put all, we've ordered these, they're gonna ship next week. We're gonna put these in the classroom, and kids are in their little cubicle. As long as kids move about as a cohort, you don't have to clean and disinfect that. If they did not move about as a cohort, then you do need to. So that's basically the elementary school. Uh, we did it in the middle school too, James. So K through eight were in cohorts. In cohorts? Yeah. Just the exceptions in the middle school would be when I go to music, yep. I'm outside my cohort likely because I could be band or chorus or orchestra, okay? Uh, and maybe one of my special classes like art or perhaps my foreign language choice didn't fit. So there's a couple of you know unusual ones, but for the most part, uh, thanks to really Ashley Dreibelbiss who did a great job, it's all scheduled as cohorts in the middle school. We can't schedule cohorts in the high school. It's impossible. There's too many levels of classes. There's too many kids who can take advanced classes, and it just can't be done. So again, I guess just in the interest of asking for a little bit more context, you know, not, not uh, um, kind of stealing your thunder, but you know, some of the next steps as we move forward, the parents are probably going to have to make some elections and choices. Um, as far as what it means that for a cohort in an elementary school, the special area teachers would come to the classroom of the students and teach within the classroom. That's one way to do it. So we're thinking it through. We're trying to think through specials. You know, we're going to have to expend, just like we have at this point, students are going to have to have their own uh, baggie of stuff that they need for art class or things that they need for regular classroom. We can't share markers or crayons or things like that anymore. We're gonna to have to create individual material bags for kids given whatever the subject area is. If we can do that and we have the art materials available, then we can move the teacher. If we can't do that, then we might need to move the kids. But really in the elementary school, there's no reason for them to ever be out of their cohort. One of the things that is a huge challenge for us though is the after school band chorus or orchestra. And we normally don't start that up until October. We met with our music director, Lou Vitello, today. We have, for the middle school and the high school, the bands are gonna be in the auditoriums. So the plan calls for 11 feet of social distance if you're singing or playing a band instrument. 11 or 12? 12. 12. Oh, I'm sorry, is it 12? 12. <laughs> Thanks, 12. We think with half the kids here on a hybrid day, we can still fit the band kids within this venue right here and also in the middle school. At the elementaries, it's gonna be a difficult call. Uh, we'll have to see how many kids we're talking about, whether or not we could have building-based bands rather than combining buildings. It's not smart for us to take kids from Ledgeview and bus them over to Harris Hill. We just, we can't get into a situation where we're doing that. So it's gonna to have to be a little different and we're working with Lou Vitello on what's the best way to do it. So, so right now we're anticipating on having a music program. I'm sorry? Right now we're anticipating on having a music program. Gee, that yes, we want music. We, we think we can do general music classes the way we've always done them. We think we can do lessons 
the way we've always done them. Now there's a couple of places that have lesson areas like Harris Hill that we might have to move, depending upon the number of kids who are in the lesson group, they might have to move to a bigger spot. But we think we can do lessons without a problem. We think we can do ensemble groups half without an issue in the middle school and the high school. Concerts are a whole nother ball game. We don't think we can do them yet. We certainly can't have in-person concerts with moms and dads. What are we thinking about, Jim? Uh, doing gym during the day? Right. I, you know, we think we can do PE the proper way. Yeah. We think we can do it. One of the things that kids are going to have to get up and get out of their classroom for PE mm -hmm. at the elementary school. Um, we think we can do it the same way in the middle school and the high school. Some of it might be during remote days if we have hybrid. Okay. Okay. Do, do we still have, or I think we do, how, how many staff do we have that are moving between buildings and is that going to continue? Do you know? I don't have a number off the top of my head. Right, off the top of my head, I'm going to say. It's very few. Yeah, the number is relatively small. We'd say less than probably, 10. Probably less than 10, yes. However, there are some people that travel and we're going to have to work that out with cohorts. And then I guess the other thing you talked about, <clears throat> the, the, the bands, which, you know, we had two buildings at the elementary level combined and so forth, and being cautious there because of busing between buildings. Um, well, we don't know what, after the governor makes his decision, what the athletic guidance will be, but right. um, we have those at the middle school that we allow to play up. Is that something that we need to review as well? I don't think we need to review that just yet. The Athletics for the fall season decision will be made by the 21st of August. And right now, we are not allowed to have interscholastic athletics as an activity. Even though we might be able to open school, we cannot do athletics. The New York State High School Athletic Association has put together a three season sport um, schedule that starts in January and ends in June. We might need to go to that. I can't see it for the first half of the year happening. I mean, certainly a sport like football, it would be very difficult for us to, we, we can't maintain social distancing, you can't play in a mask, you can't meet the guidance as it's currently iterated. Almost in any sport. I mean, maybe golf, you could do it, but it would be very difficult. And I think that the guidance from the state is gonna either be all sports or no sports. And right now, it's no sports. Dr. Okay. Ricks, um, yeah. I just want to ask a question. Um, will you be planning on running um, extracurricular activities in yeah. clubs or virtual? Or? We're only going to run the extracurricular, co-curricular activities if we can guarantee six foot of space. Okay. And we need a way to get the kids home. Yeah. So. Um, whether the late bus that we normally had here interferes with some of the other busing that we need to do, we need to figure out. First month of school, probably no, and then as we ease into it, we may be able to allow it. I think there might be some clubs that you could do virtually. Yeah, I think you're right, and we might be able to do it that way. Um, the academic portion of the plan had major changes to it, okay? So uh, we have we had three hybrid models for the elementary and three hybrid models for the middle school and high school. We've received lots of feedback and we came up with a brand new model that we want to present to the Board of Ed tonight. Um, we also put a bunch of information in about special education, universal pre-kindergarten, and more information on our remote model. So. Um, one of the things that has to be done on the 31st is a submission of the mandatory assurances by the superintendent. There are 12 pages, 20 pages, Kristen, I can't remember. 20. There's 20 pages of assurances that look like this. These are the two, these are two of them for instruction. Every school or district reopening plan has to provide for a program that includes regular, substantive interaction between teachers and students, whether delivered in person, remotely, or through a hybrid model. And again, this is the feedback that we received from the parents over the last three months of the prior school year. We need structure, and we need a regular schedule for kids who are remote, just like they would be if they're in school. And the instruction that takes place for them 
And in a hybrid model, the teacher has to really instruct these remote kids while they're instructing their in-person kids, at least get them going. Um, it has to be substantial and it has to be uh, rigorous. Okay, so these were the, there's pages and pages of these things that have to be attested to. These are the important ones. And again, taking these into consideration is why we chose this particular hybrid model. Again, we're going to present this model to, we presented it to the elementary, we're gonna do it to the middle school and the high school over the next two days. We're gonna present it to the parents on Thursday night. Given all of the guidance as it currently stands, we don't think we can open school with 100% of the kids. I know the parents are all waiting for us to make that decision, and we haven't made the decision just yet, Ethan, okay? We're making the decision based on what the governor does. However, we're planning for a hybrid. We're planning for a hybrid model, okay? We think that that's the way it's going to end up, at least for the first semester of the school year in Clarence. Our hybrid model has five groups. Group A would attend school on Monday and Thursday, and remote learning would take place on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Group B is the opposite of Group A. So the large majority of kids in grades two through 12, they're either in Group A or they're in Group B. Uh, there's, they're equal numbers between those particular groups. On Wednesday, everybody is remote. On, on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, either Group A or Group B is in attendance two of those days and remote the other two days. Now, one of the pieces of feedback is, when should those two days be? And the reason we picked Monday and Thursday and Tuesday and Friday is because we didn't want kids to go more than five days without touching base with a teacher. If we picked Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday, there would be a five-day gap between the time the kids could interact with their teacher again. However, we're taking um, feedback. If this is too difficult for parents or too difficult for teachers, we might go to consecutive days instead. So go ahead, James. So if I got a, a child in group A, is that same teacher, like, is it, like it goes back to the social studies question. The teachers teach you social studies in class, and then I got a half a kids are home, right? So are they gonna be live time with that teacher? Is the teacher yeah. gonna be? It out? doesn't necessarily have to be live stream, yep. but it has to be touching base. So I'll use myself as an example. Yep. Let's say I'm a, a 11th grade social studies teacher, which I used to be. And let's say Mike is in my in-person group mm -hmm. and Dennis is in my home group, my yeah. remote group. I have to get all my remote kids to log on at the beginning of my period because I need to take attendance. I need yeah. to know they're awake, they're at their computer, they're ready to do some work. I probably give them an assignment or two off of Schoology or some other way. I get them started, then I get over here and start doing my thing with my kids who are in class. I might give my kids who are in class a little bit of break and check back with these kids. I've got to go back and forth. Right. I don't have to stream myself teaching. If I can do that and the kids can get it, then we could do that. But I have to make sure that, he, that the remote kids are reasonably engaged with rigor and the in-person kids are reasonably engaged, okay? So we have the ability for the teachers to record themselves and put it out there. And kids could log in and, you know, with Google Meet or we're going to purchase Zoom as well as a secondary um, platform for remote teaching. So they'll have the opportunity to possibly teach both sets of kids at the, at the same, same time. They the could. Same. I mean, I can take my PowerPoint presentation or something like that, display yep. it off of my um, Google Meet. Every student is going to have a device. Because, I mean, that's how I, my business is operating, is everything is, is Teams or Google Meet or, or right. Zoom. And, it seems like as a teacher, that might be an easier way to, to skin this cat, right? Was, well, right. Everybody we will actually start with Schoology. That is the learning management system, K to 12, that everybody will log into. And okay. once you're there, then we have structures for the types of uh, synchronous live meets. Yeah, like I'm just thinking for a teacher, from a teacher's perspective, if you can stream yourself to the group at home, that's easier than trying to manage a group at home and that's teach right. a group of kids in, in the live in the classroom. So sometimes the lesson is not conducive to me streaming myself. Yep. Right. Sometimes it's a project-oriented thing. Yep. Sometimes it's a, uh, a, a practice, work-oriented thing. Mm -hmm. And I gotta get both of my sets of kids. 
I'm responsible for both sets of kids. That's what hybrid yeah. means. Yeah. I'm responsible for the remote kids. I'm responsible for the in-person kids. Now, obviously, it's easier for me to deal with the in-person kids. But if I teach one lesson to the in-person kid, and then when the remote kid comes in the next day, teach the same lesson over again, I'm only going to get through half of my stuff. Yeah. So we have to have something where we can get through a majority of the curriculum for a year. And we, you know, it's never going to be 100% because this is a remote yeah. slash in-person hybrid and it's fraught with, yeah. with difficulties. But here's what, our, here's what we're thinking. Group A, two days a week in-person, two days a week remote. Group B, two days a week in-person, opposite, two days a week remote. Everybody in Group A and B, remote on Wednesday. Wednesday is a half of an instructional day. So instead of my class period being 40 minutes on Wednesday, it's 20 minutes. I run through my whole schedule from 9 in the morning until noon. I am finished remotely, but the teachers all get that second half of the day to plan, to collaborate, to post things up in Schoology, to figure out how to do synchronous or asynchronous instruction. Okay? Group C. Can I just, we're working with the teachers now to structure yes. that? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we are already working with a, a group of 16 teachers representing K through 12. We're developing all of the organizational structures, as I mentioned earlier, and we're also building our professional development plan that will be released at the end of this week. Uh, sessions have already started asynchronously. The teachers can log on okay. and start getting that professional development, and that will take place all through the month of August as well, virtually. Yeah, because this is all For new. teachers to get, yep, to get a jump start. Yeah. So if they can't, we're also going to have something the first three days of school, and we'll right. talk about it. Right. All right, so Group A, Group Jeff, B. I have a question on Schoology. Sure. Have they gotten the upgrades done? Because I know there was a little bit of a problem yeah. logging yes. on and getting. Bandwidth, right? Yeah, exactly. bandwidth. There, there was a lot of issues. Within the first 48 hours of the closure, there was, and then after that. It seemed to be. It got better it in the last two yeah, and a half months. We monitored very closely. Because I know there are a lot of parents throughout the process that couldn't log in. Right. It wasn't we, just the first. We know we lost a couple time. people on Schoology, but we're going to get them back. <laughs> All right. Group C are, for the most part, special ed or English language learner kids who are in self contained settings, and we can keep them six feet apart. They're going to come to school every day except Wednesday. On Wednesday, they're remote, just like Group A and Group B. And those will be full days? Uh, they're full days, yes, Don. So they're in school full days. It's the 811, 812, 1211, 151, and English uh, as a new language kids. Okay? So altogether, this is uh, 120 maybe kids total spread out among six buildings. Group D. Parents who are uncomfortable choosing the option of hybrid would come to us through a survey and say, I'm uncomfortable sending my, sending my child back to school in any plan. We will give them five days of remote instruction. And the kids who are in these groups of remote instruction are going to be the same kids who are in group A and group B. They're just not going to come to school. They're going to be remote for five days. So they'll have a teacher. That teacher will have a course. That course will be taught. They'll just be, you know, the one day they'll see all their classmates is Wednesday because that's the day everybody is remote. Okay? Would it be possible, like, let's say, like, A, B, would it be the same teacher teaching? Will they get extra kids from the remote section? No, we're going to build it in to begin with. So day one, your class is going to have three different kinds of kids in it. You're going to have the in-person kids, you're going to have the remote kids who are part of the hybrid, and you're going to have the remote kids who are parents choosing the five-day option. They'll all be in the same class, by, by the same teacher. Except for grades K through 1. We might go through BOCES that way. Okay. But for grades 2 through 12, it should be the same. Mm -hmm. So what parents are going to have to understand is if they are uncomfortable and they make the choice for five days of remote, it's not nearly as effective as three days of remote and two days in person. There's just nothing that can come close to a teacher in person with kids. That is the most effective way for kids to learn. What happens when they want to switch, switch groups? 
Well, we're not going to let, if you, put, if you choose, if you're a parent and you choose group D, you have to stay in it until, for at least a half a year. What about okay. the other way? Same thing. We can't, said that they could fit. if someone, they if someone became stay. medically fragile and we had to move them to the all remote group, we could do that. But I, I thought that. Like, sometimes, like, I feel like if some kids come here expecting, I mean, we all know school's not going to be the same. It's not going to be even close. But they come here. And then they decide, wow, this is way stressful. And, you know, they, sorry. I don't know. No, they just use your microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, they come here and they, you know, this isn't much fun. My, kid, my, my friends are at home doing school. Like, right. And they realize this, I mean, I don't know, it's not fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, is that, do you think that's going to be, because I foresee that being an issue where people come in with these expectations like how they think school should probably be, uh, we know it's going to be different, but kids may not realize right. that. And are they going to all of a sudden say, well, I don't want to do this. Any I mean, uh, we think that we're going to make things for the kids rigorous. We're going to make them enticing. We're going to make them positive. And we think kids want to get back to school. I can tell you this, every kid I spoke with over the last four months wanted to get back to school. Right. So we think kids should be motivated to come to school, but it's our job to motivate them, and we will do that. You know, might there be a couple outliers out there? Maybe. But, you know, you're going to do what your mom and dad tell you to do for the most part, hopefully. <laughs> okay? All right. So group D are the uncomfortable parent. I need my kid to be remote. And those parents could also choose to home teach their kids if they wanted, but this is an option for them. And then group E. We asked ourselves, if we had to have somebody coming in every day, which grade level would be the most important to come in every day? And we decided it's kindergarten and first grade. So their hybrid, instead of two days on, two days off, their hybrid is morning, afternoon. So we're going to split grades K to 1 in half. Half of the kids will be here for the morning. Half of the kids will be here for the afternoon. And again, that'll happen every day of the week. So the kindergarten kids and the first grade kids, the kids who need the connection with their teachers the most, the kids who need to learn about what school is, the kids who need all the academic habits built at an early age, they're going to be in class every day. Only for a half a day, but the other half of the day, they're going to have some independent assignment that's done by their teacher that they can do at home or at a daycare or some other place wherever they might be. It's really hard to get kindergarten and first grade kids out of bed in the morning, sitting in front of a computer, following a regular schedule. So their remote learning is going to look a little different, but it's going to be there. And our kindergarten and first grade teachers are excited about the fact that they get to see their kids every day. Remember, our kindergarten and first grade classes are the lowest um, class size in the district. We, we could be talking here about eight to 10 kids per class once you Just remove those kids who would be 100% remote. Quick question on, on families that have students in kindergarten and first grade, mm -hmm. there will obviously be a transportation requirement in the middle of the day every day, right? So what hap what's the plan for the siblings that are in group A or group B in remote learning stuck right. at home? So that's a great question, Josh. As far as um, if you've got a kindergartner and a first grader, no, a kindergartner and a second grader or through 12. That's the participating in remote learning at home when there's a transportation need in the middle of the day. And we're asking families to transport their own kids. Gotcha. Well, we're not, we're not going to ask them in the middle of the day to transport. So we can socially distance because we'll have uh, more buses and more vehicles right. available during that middle time. But I think we've realized there's a lot of parents that that are wanting to transport their own kids. Anyway. Sure. Inevitably, there will be a parent that needs to transport a kindergartner at noon, and the third graders are in remote learning in either group A, B, C, A, B, right. C, or D. And they're going to have, we'll have to help them figure out what we're going to do with that kid. Okay. Right, we can't if they need to, the yeah, day. if they need to take the student with them, we'll cut them some slack. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, so just. I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, so like the different groups, like for family wise, are you going to try to keep like kids all in the same yeah. like group A? So, so right now today, if we try to get as close to 50% as possible, it's A through K. Is it A through L or A through K? A through K and L through Z. 
Now we're going to have to recalibrate that after we find out how many kids are fully remote. If it's a small number of kids, then it's going to stay A through K and L through Z. If it's a larger number of kids, it might be a little bit different than that. But what we're promising parents is if you have a middle schooler and you have a fifth grader, they're going to be in the same cohort. They're going to be in the same group. We're not going to you know, give you one, one kid that goes to school on you know, Monday and Thursday and another kid that goes to school on Tuesday and Friday. And that's for high school, all the, it's for overall? This right? is for everybody. Okay. So yes. again, one thing that might change are the days. You know, the elementary teachers gave us feedback today. They'd rather go Monday, Tuesday with a group of kids, same group of kids, Wednesday, everybody remote, Thursday, Friday with another group of kids. We didn't like that because it was too many days between seeing a teacher. But we're going to battle that back and forth, and before Friday, we'll make a decision on it. Okay? Jeff, I have two questions. One, I thought the guidance said that you could make changes to what you, you originally signed up for. Did that change? Well, what we need, we need people to commit, Don, especially if it's for the five days of remote. Because depending upon the number of kids who choose that, we might need to farm that out completely to the BOCES program. The remote teacher might be a BOCES employee rather than our employee, okay? So we can't keep going back and forth on that one. If you make that choice, you've got to stay that way for half a year. If you choose to be in the hybrid model, and for some reason it's not working for you, or you have a medical issue and you need to go all remote, we can probably go that way a lot easier. Right. No, I understand that. We but want we're them making to commit, all of these scheduling we changes. We require them to do it. I, oh, I'm sorry. I said I know that we want them to, but can we require them to not change? Yeah, we're going to say to them, if you make this choice, this is what you have to do. You know, this is so difficult to schedule, and there's so many variables here that we can't be all things to all people. We might be one of the very few school districts offering a five-day remote option, but these are our kids and our parents, and if they're uncomfortable, we need to offer them something. And homebound instruction or home teaching is not adequate. It's not going to help kids. Jeff, in your call today with the elementary teachers, how did they feel about having three through five or not in in every day. Were they right. on board with that? I missed what the first part I of your said question. With, on your call today with the staff, what right. were their comments about three through five, or two through, two through five. Um, five? Well, they'd like K through five to be half days. We can't do it. It's too expensive. We can't afford the busing for it. If we could do half days for K through five, we would do it, but we can't. So that their first preference would be to have everybody like K1 but we can't do it. So their next preference was Monday, Tuesday for one cohort group, Thursday, Friday for the other cohort group. And again, we had that in one of the models that we showed you earlier. Um, it might be beneficial. We're going to take a look at it, get some feedback from parents before we make the decision. And again, since it has to be the same for the middle school and the high school, we're going to see what they have to say. With um, two items. Uh, on the last slide, uh, just for clarity, I think there are... Uh, First grade was missing from the one comment. I just want to make sure I'm following correctly. So with Group E, it says kindergarten students will learn remotely every day of the week opposite their in-person. That should be kindergarten and first grade, correct? Right. Yes. Yeah, that's, sorry, Mike. That yes. should say kindergarten okay. and first grade. Okay. And then I guess right here. if I heard correctly, or maybe just I, I understand what I heard, relative to those students in let's say kindergarten or first grade or any other grade that we settle on as a model where they would be in the building consistently and the parent chooses a remote option are our teachers going to be teaching them well in k1 maybe not in grades 2 through 12 to the greatest extent possible yes but if we had an outlier um, that we couldn't take care of we would have to go to BOCES to get a teacher and I guess to, to follow up on that question, I guess as we pull our parents to understand their wishes, I guess you could have your own perspective on whether you're going to get 2% of the, the, the parents electing remote or 50%. If you get 50%, you are immediately taking the density in the classes down. Is there an option to have our teachers also have some carved out of the classroom who might be more or less uncomfortable teaching because of health reasons 
and have them provide remote instruction. Right. So there's a two-pronged answer to that. The first prong is those teachers who feel uncomfortable coming back or have some type of medical vulnerability need to go through the Americans with Disability Act protocol so that we can provide them with necessary accommodations. If they were to refuse all of those accommodations, then we would have some, you know, another issue. What do we do? Again, if we have many, many kids sign up for the five-day option, we may need to pull some of our teachers to be strictly remote teachers, okay? I don't know if we're gonna be in that position or not until we canvass our parents. So we gotta go get, we gotta get the data first, and then we might need to make some adjustments to this as a result. SED told us that the posted plan is a living document and we're allowed to make changes to it as we go along. So we're gonna do that. So for the kindergarten, if, if you have a decent amount of kids in the kindergarten and first grade that, uh, that elect to be 100% remote, are you saying that basically you would theoretically set up like a couple of virtual classrooms for just K and one so they have a group of kids that they get to know right. granted virtually? I mean, if we have class sizes after the, ki after the parents choose the five days, if we have class sizes that are super small, we might just bring everybody in, you know, because we could guarantee the six feet. So it's really the six foot distance between kids that makes all the difference. If we got down to maybe 14 kids in a kindergarten, we could bring that we, instead of doing half days, we could bring them in. Right. Do you, do you have an idea of what, what um, capacity equal, like what six, six foot spacing per student yes. equals to like, what is the percentage, what's the number, right? So um, in a normal class of about 24, um, we, we would put desks about three and a half to maximum four feet apart to stretch it out. We can get 13 or 14 in a classroom with six feet apart. Okay, so we're talking like 65, 70% of students in a classroom that normally would be in there yeah. and still keep them six feet. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'd probably be closer to 55%, but yeah. yeah, right about in there. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this describes it, and again, when we ask parents to make their choices, we're gonna give them all the information we can, but they're, they can always go to the website and take a look at this or take a look at the um, video for this particular presentation. So, you know, we wanted to make a little graphic that would make sense for it, and so we did this, okay? It's just, again, the thing that might change is when group A and group B actually are in person and when they're remote. That's, a, that's subject to change. The rest of it really isn't that subject to change. It's pretty much the same. Okay, we made uh, changes to the social and emotional learning portion of the plan. There's a reference to the comprehensive K-12 counseling plan, and we put a couple of other things on reorienting kids to school. Just so that we're gonna be clear here for the board. We have three days, three full days, prior to the time kids come back, still in the month of August, three days in the month of August, in our calendar, where we're gonna do all of the teachers' professional development. Month of September. First, second, and third. <laughs> all right, sorry. It's late. It's gonna be accurate. All three are in the months of September. That's correct. Okay, but they're before we start with kids. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so those are three days of professional development. It's all about what are you gonna do with remote learners? How are you gonna plan? What is a hybrid? How are, you gonna get, how are you gonna do this? What kind of curricular compacting do you have to do within your course? How are you gonna choose the most important things to teach, et cetera? So <clears throat> I know there's no way to address every possibility, but um, with regards to what is required that we train staff on, and may, maybe there's nothing we're required to do necessarily, but um, this is a whole new world for them. We're sure. devoting a lot of time to them to get them ready. What, if anything, can we do to prepare our bank as substitutes to handle in class instruction? Yeah. Again, we'll invite them to the trainings, sure. okay? Um, because it's very important because there's going to be subs. Okay. It's just going to happen. Uh, and, you know, that's Rob's, that's his area, and he's going to have to be involved, and we'll work with Kristen, and we'll invite the, you know, we'll invite them for the three days of in-service, okay? Yes, and we'll already make, uh, make sure they have access to Schoology, as well as the introduction uh, to Schoology courses that's available asynchronously, so that will be a part of their orientation as well. 
So again, with the reorientation of school, we want to do a soft opening for kids. So you've got three days in the first week of September, that's for adults, training, et cetera. We don't know if we're gonna bring them all in or if we're gonna do some of it remotely, we're figuring it all out. We know that it's not gonna be 800 people in here for opening day like it always has been. You know, at the most, we're gonna be able to get 30, 40 people in here and that's gonna be it. So there's gonna be multiple venues, we're gonna to move to the teachers, the teachers are gonna stay where they are, we're gonna bring the staff development to them. Okay, including opening day. So Mike, I don't know if there's a spot for you on that, but I know that <laughs> breaks your heart. Um, also, soft opening. We've got Monday, Labor Day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all half days for everybody. We bring in the cohorts, two days each. All we do with the teachers, protocols, procedures, policies, how to move around, how to stay safe, how to, what happens if my mask breaks, what do I do if I have to go to the bathroom, how do I walk in the hallways? Because we now have one-way hallways. So we think it's gonna take two days with the kids, and remember, if we bring the cohorts in, that's four days, to teach them everything we need to teach them, very little academic stuff, all policies and procedure stuff, soft open, the next week, we start with the whole hybrid model. And I assume we're putting signs up and everything throughout the school with the, I mean, it's every other business is doing it, directional, you know, how the stairways get traveled and, and right. items like that to help right. the kids along. Absolutely, so we'll have signage, we'll have floor signage, yeah. we'll have posted signage, we'll have videos for the kids. Um, for the little kids, we'll have social story videos. We're gonna spend some time getting everybody reacclimated to school. This is critical for us. We want to make sure that kids get reoriented. We want them to make their connections. We want them to be able to see their friends and their teachers again, but we want everybody safe. And this would also be the time every student in grade K through 12 will be assigned a device. Yeah. So we wanna make sure on those opening days that we walk them through the procedures of how to log in, what programs right. will they utilize. We'll make sure we take care of all of that tech support that needs to happen yep. you know, face to face in those additional days as well. Do we, anti do we anticipate being short subs? I mean, we're short subs normally and yeah. I have to anticipate, you know, hopefully no one gets sick. But, yeah, uh, if, we don't know, but we would guess we're gonna be, yeah. Are we casting a net to see if we could pick up more subs? Well, you know, we're gonna do the best we can. Yeah, I'm just asking. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, again, social emotional learning, critical stuff for the first four days of school. Then we'll start getting into the academic stuff. We will, we'll, we're gonna support the heck out of our teachers and our kids. We're gonna get kids back here, but we're gonna do it in a safe manner where we mitigate the risk as much as possible. The amount of planning that's gone into this is tremendous. I wanna just put a word in for our administrators who really have been doing this since probably uh, late March. Yeah. Okay? All right, this was our transportation survey results. We already talked about it. You know, we got back 300, about 3,500 responses. There's about 500 people out there still that have to get to us. We think the numbers are gonna hold. You know, anywhere from 50 to 60% of the kids are gonna be transported by their parents. That's gonna help us. So that's a big, you know, thank you. We are opening the buildings early so that uh, parents and kids can drop off early if they don't wanna get stuck in a line, you know, at the normal drop off time. So a half an hour before schools are open, all the buildings will be open for parents to drop their kids off early. And I, I'm assuming we're gonna figure out a way to socially, dis socially distance them when they get in? Yes, we have entry and exit procedures yeah. that will have the best social distancing we can do. But remember, they all absolutely have to have masks on at that point. When they come in. Yeah. I mean, once they're, because we're gonna have kids now 30 minutes in the building 30 minutes beforehand. So that's just something that yeah. I know you they got it. You know, we're going to start instilling it immediately. That's why we think we need those four days. Yep. You know, just to make sure that we're telling kids masks, masks, masks. And we're looking at changing our code of conduct for the masks. Is that right. It? We'll give you the code of conduct language at the August meeting. Rob has redone it. You mentioned videos, um, like t teaching the students, or kind of like easing their nerves. Or any of the, will any of that content be available before they set their first foot in the door of the school? Yeah, that's Absolutely. great. They can see that stuff at home and yes. Absolutely. And what we're, we're going to do when we send our letter home, canvassing parents, 
we're going to ask them to begin mask wearing practice with their kids right now if they haven't already done it. I'm sure that, you know, if they've been anywhere in this area, they've had to wear a mask to go someplace. So again, we're going to work with parents, try to give them the same videos. You know, there's some cartoon kind of ones for little kids and that type of thing. So access to Schoology, um, it, it was asked earlier, we're looking at professional development opportunities for parents as well. So we'll oh, walk great. parents through how to access Schoology, and then also have introductory courses available for them as well. Thank you, and we would include some of those, those videos prior to the start of the year. Do we have in mind, you're going to survey the parents. There's obviously, have to get the survey results back, a significant amount of effort that goes into scheduling afterwards. Um, do we have a date in mind where parents are going to have to Yeah, we really think we're going to send the survey out Friday morning because that's the day our plan is due. We're going to send the survey out Friday morning. We're going to ask for it back within a week. All right, that's an ambitious time frame, but we're going to push. Again, we think the large majority of parents are on our mass communication, text mail, email blast uh, method. So I think, Jeff, a lot of parents are going to want to know what the district is going to do before they decide. So when will we make So Thursday decision? night is our big meeting, right? Thursday night mm -hmm. is the big parent meeting. We could have as many as, you know, all 4,100 parents on if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And we've advertised it. We've, won, we've gone through the PTOs. We've asked all the movers and shakers and Clarence to get the word out. Usually it doesn't take long after we do that. <laughs> uh, last time we did this, we had 250 people at a Google Meet. I think we can get many, many more for this. Mm -hmm. It'll, there'll be a Q&A explanation after we do the meeting. But it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, th this is the recommendation. Like, right. what, what is the district doing? This is what, the, th this right. is what your suggestion is. So, you know, and again, I just want to preface it by saying, contingent upon what the governor does, right. our recommendation is going to be hybrid. So, so whether the governor says hybrid or full, full in person, this is what, this is our proposal. Yeah, we don't think we can do full in person and meet all the guidelines. So we feel like we have to have the option of hybrid. So it sounds like when the presentation goes to the parents this, on Thursday of this week, this is what we're, well, this is what you're pitching to them. I am. Assu With, and, assuming the governor allows yeah. students in the building in one way, shape, or form. Yes. And again, we might tweak a couple things right. based on their feedback, but yeah, we're, you know, we think it's time to tell parents where we think we're going. Because I think, I think, to add on to that, I think right now the only two options we're looking at, right, is hybrid or if the governor says you have to be home. Right. I mean, we're not really looking. I think that the parents need to hear that on Thursday, right, that our, our two options are either hybrid or home. We're not, we're not pushing in all in person. Yeah, we're not. Uh, now, if the rules changed mm -hmm. and allowed us to push in person, then we might consider it. Yeah. But we can go from hybrid to in-person or from hybrid to remote pretty easily. You know, going the other way around from in-person yeah. to hybrid would have been very difficult. But at least on Thursday, parents will have the opportunity to understand where, where we're coming from. Right. And then the next day, they'll get a survey that they'll have a week to think about what group they want their child to be in. Exactly. And again, we might be a little different than other districts out there. I don't know how many people are going to give the five-day remote option, but I feel like from an educational necessity part, we need to do that. What is your sense from the other superintendents? Hybrid. Have you guys talked about this? We've talked about it, and you know, I can't speak for other people, but I'm going to say that most people would have real difficulty fulfilling all of the guidelines, and that hybrid looks like it's the best way to start. And what is your sense from discussions, just your interpretation of if other districts will be offering a full five-day remote option. Yeah, I don't know yet, okay. honestly. You know, I kind of let them know we were considering that, and then last time we met with the administrative group, we made the decision we have to do it. Yeah. It's educationally sound practice, even if it's not written in the guidance. You know, we will have the ability to do the five days of remote. We're going to do the five days of remote. It won't be the same. <coughs> And again, when we speak with parents and when we give them the information about choice, we have to let them know that the hybrid method is educationally more sound for them than five days of remote. But if they're super uncomfortable, if they can't, you know, if we don't want to push them into home teaching or something like that, which really is not a good viable option for their kids. 
Um, Jeff, I know that the district does a really good job with our kids transitioning um, elementary to middle, middle to high school, and I know things look really different this year, but can you speak to what additional supports our right. transitioning kids will have because we can't do the traditional freshman orientation? So we're trying to figure that out right now, Mary Beth. We think that if we break the freshmen and the sixth graders, and really the kindergartners, into small enough groups, we can bring them in here and do the orientation. Oh, that would be great. Yes. Uh, but if we do it, we have to do it for kindergarten, sixth grade, and ninth, mm -hmm. or we don't do it for any of them. And we're trying to figure out the orientation right now, and we think we can get groups that are small enough so that we can you know, have the traditional experience of letting kids go around and find their locker. And again, they're going to be limited to the number of times they can go to their locker. Mm -hmm. They're really not going to be able to go to their locker at all, except for the beginning of the day. Right. So it's a little less important that, it's yeah. still important that a kid know how to open their locker. That's a critical yeah. freshman, yeah. I, I think grade. that would be, if we could do that, that would be, you know, so helpful for, especially right. the freshmen coming So in. we're going to give it a shot and we'll let the parents know before we get to those dates. Awesome. If I may, I just want to go back to the question Mr. Fuchs had earlier regarding what would be required for professional development. I think it's really important that we mention we actually surveyed all 380 teachers after the closure to find out what are you know, the necessities in terms of professional development, and we're utilizing that to plan those opening days very, very carefully so that we're really targeting you know, what direction do we need to go in terms of remote learning as well as social-emotional learning. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions by the board? Um, just one. I think you commented, but just maybe talk a little bit about the high school um, with with the density. There was a comment. I don't remember if I read it in the plan or elsewhere, with regards to potentially reducing elective offerings. In All right. So one of the things that we have to do at the high school is try to get class sizes that are bigger than 28, um, less than that, because even if we can get complete 50 percent. That still means 14 kids. And again, what Rick said is, that's about the limit in a class. So one thing that, we, that we're going to have to do is reduce social studies and English elective classes and make the core English 9, 10, 11, 12 classes have more sections in them so that we're guaranteed that even when we cut it in half, we're gonna be okay. And again, that's going to affect some kids. There's not going to be as many offerings. They're electives. They're not mandatory for graduation. But we're going to have to make sure that those courses that are mandatory are as small as possible. The other thing is in math, we do many different levels. You know, we do a two-year option for algebra. We do um, a regents and non-regents option. We do all these different things. We're going to have to combine some of those options. And there might be one or two options rather than six or seven options for math. So is, is it fair to say that those, those decisions necessarily haven't been carved in stone? And I guess why I'm asking is that as we survey the students, if, and if I'm understanding the process, if we have enough that elect remote instruction, that solves the density yeah, problem and we right. would have less of an impact on the schedule? Or have we had to already make those decisions and start the scheduling process? Right, so lo yes, that inference is logical. Okay. And again, we have to wait until we get those numbers before we recalculate. The high school has finished their scheduling process and so has the middle school. Now we're going to have to go back in and tweak it given the number of kids who choose five days of remote. And again, maybe that allows us more flexibility. We still think we can do the AP offerings. We still think we can do the SUPA and New Step off offerings. We're just going to have to cap it at 27 kids probably. There's going to be some caps on there, and there might be some kids that get pushed out. There always is anyway. And again, you start with seniors, give them what they need, and then move backward. Any other questions from the board? Tricia? Um, well, you were talking about APs. And stuff. I know there's like attendance requirements on those. Are those going to be relaxed? Because, like, you know, before I feel like seniors or juniors come to school and are not necessarily feeling well because they can't miss that class. Is that something like now when you're, you know, you're not really feeling good, but you don't have COVID, are you, I mean, are you yeah. telling kids to stay home if they really Well, we're saying if you answered yes to any of the survey questions, you absolutely have to stay home. If you feel lousy, stay home. However, we're not going to relax the attendance requirements. We're probably going to be more stringent about checking up and making sure, especially when kids are remote. 
We want kids to log on to the computer in the beginning of their class when they're remote, have their attendance taken, know that they're there, give them a structure for learning. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing that's happening in the classroom, but it has to be something rigorous. So, so Jeff, when we get a kid that checks yes, are we able to trans, for the short term that that kid may be to 10, 14 days, that that kid may be out, right, say it's right. COVID? So what we'll do is we'll contact the parents like we always do for an yeah. absence, if they tell us there's a suspicion of COVID, we probably will have, to, will have to inform the DOH and we'll probably have to give them directions on getting your kid tested. And what I mean is, can we jump that kid for the 14 days into the remote learning so we can keep track of the class? Like if they're, if they're an AP student, right, and they're gonna be home for 14 days, 10, day, 10 days. Yeah, I mean, they can always log in remotely because the login's the same. So they can, so if they're an A, a kid, uh, the A right. kid. They if they were in a quarantine, they'd be able to keep going. They'd be able to keep going yes. remotely. Yes. And yeah. would they stay? Even if they're sick, oh, right? If they're, technically, even if they're sick, they could go to the remote section. They can. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And they would, if they were in Group A or Group B, they would stay in that section rather than flipping over to Group D with a potentially new group of virtual friend, virtual classmates. Yeah, they'd, and they'd have to stay in as in their group. Right. Stay in their cohort. Stay as scheduled. Our, and then as. Sorry, as far as recommendations for testing or guidance for testing, uh, how, who, who, yeah. where do we direct them to do that? And uh... So we're going to purchase some tools for them, and including Schoology. They have the ability to do online assessment. Oh, I'm sorry, not I, I meant COVID testing. COVID testing. Oh, sorry about yeah, that. the COVID testing is up to the DOH. Yes. So we'll okay. get, you know, we'll, we have a protocol for a suspicion. We have a protocol if there's a confirmed case. The DOH should know before we do. But sometimes the physician of the family knows before the right, DOH right. does, so we're going to stay in contact. What, what Gail Burstein has told us is they will send us a contact tracer. If we've kept kids six feet apart, if we've had kids with masks on, right. they may not consider anybody at risk. Right. They may just let us clean the room and get back to business within 24 hours. And I noticed in the plan there were several, portion, several uh, spots that mentioned um, suspected or confirmed, and then some things had changed when it flips to a confirmed case. Right. But just, I mean, recently, tests are, t tests are taking three to 10 days right. to come back. Right. So it's, I think we're, we're going to have to end up treating any suspected case right. equal to a confirmed case and really not relying on confirmed cases to make any decisions because it will be way too long. I agree with you. We've had some luck with um, the people that we've spoken to who are like relatives of employees. They're getting 48 hours. So if we can get that, I agree with you, we're, we're gonna be fine. But if we can't, then we probably have to treat every suspicion like a... And they're being tested through that group that's... They're being tested like hours. Erie Community College, places like that. Okay. If it has to go to the federal level, I think it's weeks, yeah. and that could be bad. Um, any other questions? Jeff, do you, I noticed do you think there's no... Be, um, the, because he brings up a good point about testing and testing done in class on the days that they are in school versus um, my daughter is an incoming freshman and she talked quite to, a bit to me about kids cheating and forming cheating groups when we had to do whatever we could do just to survive the last month of school. Um, so it just might be something to keep in mind as, as far as testing the kids. Um, and are we, so, and we're gonna have numeric grades yeah, we're, yeah. we're going to stick with numbered grades uh, at the Secondary. 6 through 12 level, Secondary level. and, and then we'll also, standards sorry. based at the elementary. And we're also exploring um, through the technology being able to go in what we would call kiosk mode, so that would really kind of shut down students' accessibility <laughs> to any of these other sources. <laughs> so that's so definitely talented. something that we're looking into as well. So one of the things we're really hoping for that hasn't happened yet because it's a federal decision we don't see how we're going to be able to have Regents exams if we start in a hybrid situation. We don't see how we're going to be able to have grades three to eight testing. Right. But again, that's something that has to go from the feds to the state to us. Right. Don, did you have a question? Um, no, just a comment. I noticed that we don't have a public comment session, but we do have the microphone and okay. we have Ethan if he has, can right. we see if he has any questions? Sure. Anybody from the audience have, Ethan, you have any questions? No, no problem, buddy. I'm eat, sleep, and live. <laughs> COVID-19 plan. Yes. 
No, you can just yell out to us. Sure. You're socially distanced. You're okay. Go ahead. Possible, yeah, possibly.